top cyclists can reach a speed of 15 metres a second. That's 35 miles an hour. But during a race, the speed will vary. To understand how something gets faster or slower, you need to know about forces. It's forces that change the speed. So what are the forces acting on the bike and its rider? To move forwards, the rider needs to apply a forward force. Three, two, one. She pushes hard on the pedals. This forward force changes the speed of the bike. It accelerates. But the bike doesn't keep going faster and faster forever. Why is it, even though the cyclist keeps pedalling, her speed remains the same? As well as the force pushing the bike forwards, there are counter-forces trying to push it back. So what are these counter-forces? There's friction between the tyres and the track. Friction between moving parts on the bike. And the cyclist is pushing against the force of air. Inside the cycle track, the air is still. As the cyclist moves through the air, air resistance starts to bend the flag. The faster the cyclist goes, the greater the force of air pushing the flag and the rider backwards. So, as the cyclist pushes the bike forwards, friction and air resistance are working against it, effectively pushing it back. If the forward force and the backward force balance out, the speed of the bike remains constant. See if you can work out what's providing the forward force and the backward force for these moving objects. When forces are balanced, speed remains constant. So how can our cyclist change her speed? Come on, Yvonne, big effort! Last time now, hop, come on, keep it going! Hop, hop, come on! What's happening to the forces now? As she presses harder on the pedals, the forward force is increased. The forward force and the counter force are no longer balanced, so the speed of the bike changes, it accelerates. But again, she doesn't get faster and faster forever. What's happening to the counter forces? There's a small increase in friction. 
and a big increase in the force of air pushing backwards. The faster the bike goes, the greater the counter forces. Eventually, the forces are balanced and the cyclist reaches a new constant speed. To get faster, she's got to keep unbalancing the forward and backward forces. She's got to keep applying a bigger and bigger forward force. OK, Yvonne, that's enough now. One down, that's very good. Call it a day now. Great. Racing bikes like these don't have any brakes. Instead, the cyclist simply stops pressing down on the pedals. The forward force is now much smaller. The forces are unbalanced again, so the speed of the bike changes. This time, it gradually slows down. When a skydiver jumps out of a plane at 3,000 metres, her speed goes through some big changes. To explain how all these changes in speed occur, you need to think about the forces involved. So what's happening to the forces as you fall through the air? The force of gravity is always trying to pull us towards the Earth. Before the skydiver jumps, the floor of the plane provides a counterforce which balances the downward force of gravity, right up until the moment she steps out. Gravity immediately pulls her towards the ground and she starts to accelerate downwards. But air resistance is acting in the opposite direction. The faster she falls, the greater the air resistance. Eventually, the upward force of the air equals the downward force of gravity. When forces are balanced, the speed remains constant. That doesn't mean she stopped falling, it means she stopped accelerating. She's still doing a steady 55 meters per second, and hitting the ground at this speed isn't a good idea. To slow down, the upward force needs to be greater than the downward force. When the parachute opens, air resistance suddenly becomes much greater than gravity. The forces are no longer balanced, and this changes her speed. She slows down. Because she's slowing down, air resistance decreases until it balances gravity again and she reaches a much slower constant speed. Approaching the ground at 5 metres per second is a much better idea.
As she hits the ground, there's a thumping great counterforce from the Earth, which decelerates her very quickly. So, for skydivers to land safely, they need to understand forces and use air resistance to slow themselves down. To go as fast as possible, it's important for speed cyclists to reduce air resistance as much as they can which is why they wear streamlined helmets, snug-fitting clothes, and why they ride in a position which cuts through the air efficiently. But why do they ride so close to each other? And why do they take turns riding at the front? It's all to do with air resistance. The front cyclist feels the full force of the air as they move forwards. But the second cyclist is shielded. For them, the air resistance is reduced. To go at the same speed as the cyclist in front, a smaller forward force is needed. So the second cyclist doesn't have to pedal as hard. And the same applies to cyclists 3, 4 and 5. By riding close together, they save energy, taking it in turns to ride at the front and bearing the full force of the air pushing backwards. Magnificent condor in full flight, effortlessly conquering the force of gravity. Which is more than you can say for these guys. Condor 6, humans nil. Gravity is pulling this plane towards the ground, so why doesn't it fall out of the sky? There must be a counter force pushing upwards. This upward force is called lift. Even a jumbo jet weighing over 300 tonnes can create enough lift to get off the ground. So how does it work? You can create lift by blowing over the top of a piece of paper. Air particles are bumping into the paper from all sides. These create forces. If the paper isn't moving, the air forces above and below must be balanced. Blowing pushes the air particles over the top of the paper, so fewer particles hit it from above. The downward force is momentarily smaller than the upward force, so the paper rises. For a wing to work, it needs to be able to create lift. So what shape does it need to be? A wind tunnel allows us to look at the way air flows around different shapes. The smoke streams show that for a symmetrical shape, air travels over the top in exactly the same way as it travels underneath. So will this shape fly? 
This machine demonstrates lift. First, the wing is locked into place. The weight of the wing holds it down. But it's free to move upwards if it creates lift. Nothing happens. The forces above and below this wing shape must be balanced. So what happens if we change the shape? With an asymmetrical wing, the pattern of airflow over the top is different to the airflow underneath. Will this make a difference? Air passing over this shape makes it move upwards. It creates lift. To move upwards, the forces above and below the wing must be unbalanced. The force pushing down must somehow be smaller than the force pushing up. With an asymmetrical shape, the air has to travel further over the top than it does underneath. If it has to travel further in the same amount of time, the air over the top must be travelling faster. We know from our piece of paper that making the air flow faster over the top reduces the downward force. The downward force is smaller than the upward force, so the wing lifts. When a plane goes fast enough, the wings create enough lift for it to take off. But sometimes, you don't want moving objects to fly. You'd rather they stayed firmly on the ground. Aerofoils on the back of racing cars are there to make sure the cars stay in contact with the road. But can you explain how they work? <laughs> 